This episode brought to you by How to Write Manga, your complete guide to the secrets of Japanese comic book storytelling. Available wherever fine ebooks are sold. The world has gone insane. Cosplayers rule the conventions, gamers dominate the tabletop, and the internet. Sci fi subjugates the movies. And fantasy rules the bookstore with an iron fist. Only one group can bring order to this unruly mob. A team of uber geeks, masters of the nerdly arts, trained for decades in the hobby shops and basements of the nation. Mobilized by the secret masters, they are the Department of Nerdly Affairs. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Department of Nerdly Affairs. I'm your host, Rob Patterson, here with my co-host, Don Chisholm. Hey. And tonight, we're going to be talking comedy role-playing games. And who better to discuss comedy with than the funniest man we know, Chad. Welcome to the show, Chad. Oh, I, I had a line prepared, and I, I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to start again? Just think of something funny. No, no, keep going. <laughs> Think of something funny and pretend like I came up with it. <laughs> oh, Chad, you're such a card. <laughs> okay, so, as I said, tonight we're going to be talking about comedy role-playing games. Um, it's an area that uh, not many people think about. Uh, the two hardest genres of uh, role-playing, for tabletop anyway, have often been said to be horror and comedy. And since we covered horror not too long ago... We thought it was time to cover comedy as well, hmm. which is perhaps even more difficult to run than horror. At least horror, you can just like set some mood music and have play some weird sound effects and, you know, you know, turn down the lights and such. Comedy is a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. So why is comedy so difficult, Don? Um, well, this is one of the things, especially for a role playing game. Like we said, um, we've mentioned before, if you run horror or if you run drama, Part of those genres requires you putting your, your character, yourself, in, in essence, purposefully at the disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult for a lot of gamers because, again, the gaming part takes precedent for a lot of people. It's about succeeding, solving the adventure, beating the villain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Comedy takes that a step further because you have to not only put yourself intentionally at disadvantage, you have to like laud in it and play it up and just run with how horrible things out of control things have gotten. Right. And I think that again, that's antithetical to, to gaming. I think for a lot of people, because a lot of people do play more um, goal driven games. Like, yeah, you know, it's all about beating the bad guy. It's all about, you know, kicking monster, butt, whatever. And so that's one of the reasons why, again, both horror and comedy are so difficult. And yes, comedy is especially difficult because the point of a comedy game isn't to defeat the bad guy per se. I mean, it's to have fun, maybe. I, in fact, to be honest, <laughs> I'm not even sure what the hell the point of a comedy role-playing game is. What's See, you're already on the right track. <laughs> I mean, really, I, I'm going to be honest with everyone who's listening. I'm going to come out and put my confession right at the beginning of this show. I'm one of those rare people that never quite got comedy role-playing games. I've even run some, but the truth is, is that I've always found the only way I could run a comedy role-playing game was to basically run what is effectively a straight game, but with really weird characters or situations. And then that's the closest I could really make comedy work at least usually for me anyway because again mm. i guess i'm just too goal oriented but is that how it's usually done come on tell me guys am, am i in the wrong i i think um you, you've hit that kind of part of uh the difficulty of running a comedy game as opposed to a dramatic game is mm -hmm. you can impose drama on people mm. Uh, like you can, you can, you can always just say, and then like orcs show up, or if you really, if you're going for more like I guess the literary dramatic thing, you can say, oh, I failed my saving throw. What happens? Well, the spider's venom is fatal, but it's slow acting. There's no cure. Your character has two days to live. What do you do? And mm. it in, it instills that sense of 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 literary drama right away because now you have a, a an actual doomed hero. Mm -hmm. 
comedy is difficult because comedy requires that the participant, the victim in, in essence plays along and plays it up. <clears throat> and I, I okay. think in, in some ways, I think that's why some people just aren't funny because there's a certain measure of self depreciation to comedy. Mm-hmm. And especially like in a role playing game, it's, it's, if your character gets whacked, something bad happens. It's not a question of how do I fix this and carry on? It's a question of how do I keep this going and keep the shtick going and add something to it and make it funny. Right. And that's not always easy, especially since you're doing this in front of, you know, a live audience. And the truth yeah. is many gamers are also introverts. That's partly why they got into this whole hobby in the first place. Hmm. Um, in fact, stepping out to ro play role-playing games for many gamers, being introverts, is actually a challenge to begin with. And then to ask them to play comedy on top of that, mm -hmm. I mean, to make a fool of themselves and to kind of just revel in it. I mean, that's a pretty tall order for some players. Oh, I think so, yeah. I think it also can be really hard on the GM, too, because mm. uh, if, invariably there's always this chance. In fact, in a lot of cases with these, these kind of games is that the, the game's going to go off the rails. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and you're not supposed to, at that point, try to stop it. Right. You know what I mean? Like, if it, if you, it goes into absurdity, it just goes there. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, under, like, say, no, playing a normal straight-laced game, mm -hmm. the minute it gets too kooky or too weird, you immediately, your first, you know, your first uh, instinct is to grab the reins and pull it back and make it, you know, get it back on track. Whereas, you know, the, the, the comedy ones technically should just be free to kind of go bananas and... Go, and go wherever it goes right well i guess it does though depend on the nature of the comedy game as we're going to talk about there are different kinds of comedy games mm -hmm. and some of them you kind of should keep it on the rails so to speak and then other ones yeah just whatever <laughs> happens happens they can they can just wander off into uh pure absurdity and i guess that's okay i guess I, um again hmm. I'm, i tend to be a little more on the structuralist side of things so therefore i tend to like slightly more serious games overall but yeah. but but I, I can appreciate a comedy game i mean heck you know i enjoy when i'm running doing little funny shticks and have you know having fun with the game just playing regular serious games just to make lighten them up but mm -hmm. to do an actual pure comedy game is a whole other level yeah, I, th I think you guys have kind of hit on one of the other weird things about comedy role-playing games, specifically. Mm -hmm. Right. Is there's a kind, there's a thing I would call nerdly humor. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, like, patrons of the nerdly arts tend to be intellectuals. Like you said, they tend to be more introverted, maybe more introspective. Again, more, mm -hmm. more cerebral. Mm -hmm. And what, what you find happens in almost every nerdly art you get these little through lines of comedy, but they tend to be more like a witticism or God help us a pun or some kind of intellectual play on things. Mm -hmm. And for role playing games, a lot of games already have that kind of thing in them somewhere. Right. And I think for, for a lot of people, especially say old school gamers and mm -hmm. getting into like, like the pre, the pre uh, like narrativist, tight games the ones when it was it was closer to the war gaming closer to the number crunching mm. there was this idea that they would instill kind of a wit to things that you would have like mm. a clever word play or you would you would develop a situation along an unexpected but still appropriate for the setting kind of way kind of kind of kind of like a monty python-esque kind of thing right and I, and I think because that's inherent to a lot of games, it's difficult for people to amp that up because it takes it, like you guys were saying, it takes it to this other level that people aren't interested in or comfortable with. And your need for ha-has is already being satisfied to a lesser degree as things go along. Yeah, exactly. I mean games should be fun they always are but mm -hmm. in a weird way comedy games are often trying to force it they and, can yeah and in that sense it can be a little bit yeah uncomfortable but 
wow, we're doing a great job of selling comedy RPGs, aren't we, so far? <laughs> like, they're horrible. They make you laugh and have fun. It's the most awful thing ever. Honest, folks. There, we can just, Rob, we can just skip to the end. Yeah, don't play. Yeah, just don't play. <laughs> okay. Good night, folks. Bye. Well, that was a short podcast. What do we do now? <laughs> well, I think probably we should just let's focus this a little bit by um, actually talking about some of the different comedy games that are out there because let's assume that a good number of our audience members have not actually played a comedy game or might only know a very few. Yeah. I mean, I if you ask most people who or even gamers about what a comedy role-playing game is, there's only a very small number of answers you're generally going to get except for the fact that there actually are a fairly large number of games. I wouldn't say large, but there are a substantial number of comedy games but most people have just never heard of them or played with them, or whatever. Um, yeah. So, let's start with the one that I think almost every gamer has heard of at one point or another, because it is so absolutely famous. And that would, of course, would be Paranoia. Mm-hmm. I think Paranoia, in a lot of ways, has become known as the comedy role-playing game. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's the one that most gamers have at least tried once in their lives. That, that Most gamers, not including me, actually. I'm one of the few people who's never played it. But wow. I believe you guys have. Oh yeah. Have you ever? I actually never did. No. 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 Nope. Oh, and that comes from Chad and I being part of the same high school group. So um, mm-hmm. yeah, we never had the chance. So Don, describe Paranoia for us, since you're the only one who's played it. <laughs> okay, I'll describe it. And Paranoia kind of. There's a couple of points when you get into like specific games, and Paranoia illustrates both. Mm-hmm. It's sometimes difficult to lock down what a comedy game is exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, co- comedy role playing games never really came into their own. Mm-hmm. Like, like they never became a thing. Like you can say, there's fantasy games, there's sci fi, there's horror. Comedy was never its 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 own thing. It usually kind of piggybacks on something else. Mm-hmm. Um, paranoia fits into that because paranoia again, um, it's funny because it's parody. It's parody of a lot of what was going on at the time for e- any of the editions. But it's still science fiction because within the setting, everything that happens makes perfect sense. You better explain the setting, Don. Okay. I think we've mentioned it before. Um, the idea is uh, World War Three happens and the players take part, play um, citizens of Alpha Complex, which is this institution that survived. And it changes depending on the adventure. Sometimes it's like a, a city of domes above ground. Sometimes it's like tunnels. Doesn't really matter. What matters is it's run by the computer, which is this semi-sentient, totally mental thing that guides all of society. And it's it's your typical 1984 Brazil-esque oppressive society. Um, the players the players play troubleshooters who are kind of like secret agents slash police officers, and you 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 have to deal with the bureaucracy. And there's running gags like you always get experimental equipment that you have to test, even though you don't want to, and it's going to kill half the group. Um, <laughs> you're you're looking for traitors and members of secret societies. So of course, everybody's character starts the game as a member of a secret society. Okay. And most of the game is spent trying to get dirt on the rest of the group, as opposed to just trying to solve the adventure. Okay. And and hij- hijinks ensue. <laughs> well, I believe that now. And do you get experience points for like ratting out the group? How does the game encourage you to focus on your own group members? Well, the, the, you, you get points. You, you gain treason points. And when you hit a certain number, your character is executed. Usually oh, by the rest of the group. And then the group gets commendation points. Uh, you do uh-huh. get, X, you get XP. It doesn't matter. You're not going to last that long. Um, paranoia gets around the problem that a lot of comedy games have of character death by Mm -hmm. every character is part of a six member clone family. Mm -hmm. And when one of your guys die, the next one who led a remarkably similar life and has all the same skills and abilities and equipment, oddly enough, is somehow shunted back into the adventure to continue. And they've done running gags at that one, one, uh, adventure has a pneumatic tube system they've invented. Uh Uh-huh. To, to get replacement clones into the adventure quicker, but it doesn't always work right. Right. There's even an adventure where you go into space and all of your clones go with you, but they're kept in suspended animation on the ship. Uh huh. Just in case you need them, or correction, when you need them. When when you need them, yeah. And it's 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 
they tell y'all through the book the game master should resist the urge to just kill everybody off right away. Right. Because <laughs> the game encourages the game master to screw over the players. Okay. And the funny thing is, everybody should play Paranoia because that game has got me through so much of life. It's like uh-huh. a prep. Uh, it's like a prep exercise. It really is, like for dealing with like bureaucracy and companies and that. That game taught me and and most of the guys that we played with back in the day will say the same thing. It it taught us how to deal with bureaucracy in so many ways. Hmm. Which is usually you... just turning the bureaucracy in on itself and away from you, right? Yeah, or or learning what you can ignore or. Mm-hmm. One of my favorites is always pick a random shift manager, and if a supervisor's like getting in your face or starting to spin and, and that, and you need to get rid of them for a bit. Oh, um, such and such was looking for you. Did you get a hold of you? Oh my god, what? And then they'll go to the office. The person in the office won't remember. Did I call them or not? So you get like twenty minutes of like peace of mind doing shit like that, eh? Oh and, boy. And you learn that paranoia is all about learning how to do that. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay then, I can see that. Yeah, I. Uh, uh, and, mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead. So yes, corporate world training one a one. Okay, mm-hmm. and I know paranoia is still played. I mean, not too long ago, I overheard some of my students in one of my classes at the college discussing a game of paranoia. Yeah, they've they've done they've done different editions. They're up to like the fifth edition, I think. Yep. And uh, they were talking about how fun it was. And I just quietly listened as I was, you know, doing teacher stuff at the front of the room. <laughs> okay. it and brought a smile to my face. I mean, it's just hearing that kids today are still playing Paranoia. Even though mm. I have not actually done it myself, but it's a classic. So I, I'm, I'm happy with that still. <laughs> um, speaking of classics, I think that the very first comedy role-playing game, I'm pretty sure, was Toon. At least as far as I know. Would that be correct? Um, I think Toon was the first one anyone ever heard of. I think the actual first one was Alma Mater. Well, let's see. Toon was 84. Yeah, the Alma, Alma Mater, Mater was like 82. Was 82. You yeah. are correct, sir. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. uh, most people never heard of Alma Mater. I had vaguely heard of it, but I wasn't exactly sure. Have, have you actually played it, Don? Yeah, I have a copy of it. Okay, well, tell us about Alma Mater, then. <laughs> um, if you ever seen, like, Animal House, or I guess nowadays, like, Van Wilder, or any of those kind of shows, mm-hmm. it's it's that, the role-playing game. Okay. Okay, so it's... Well, those kinds of movies were popular in the late 70s, early 80s, so that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it's, that's why I say it's basically Animal House, the role-playing game. What are you supposed to do in it, then? Uh, it's another one, and again, it 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 kind of it it's that pseudo comedy kind of game because mm-hmm. it's still it's still and it's funny to read now because it's still written like an old school role playing game. So there's like tons of charts and diagrams and modifiers, but it's it's what do you do? You're like a character in high school, and and you go through like a stereotyped kind of like Hollywood B movie kind of high school. Mm-hmm. And again, getting to the point for like a comedy game, it's got that thing you have to be as a player self-motivated. Right. Like it's not like orcs are going to attack your school and you're going to have to come up with something. You know, like how do we beat the orcs? It's, it's okay, my guys, I'm going to play like the drug dealer guy. So then you play your game trying to like peddle your stuff and not get caught by the cops. Like, you know, if if you say my guy's the... If my guy's the brain guy and I'm going to like try to get into a good college so I can get a good job and then buy all these bastards that are picking on me now. And then you'd have to like, and there's rules for how well you do in class and studying. And then the game master would have to come up with things that would, you know, get in the way of that. So they might give you an irritating little brother that's always aggravating you or like the football team locks you in a locker over the weekend so you can't study. And it's that kind of thing. So what you're telling me is it's teenagers from outer space just without the aliens. <laughs> without the outer space. <laughs> and without the outer space, yeah. It it kind of is, except it's it's uh a little more mean spirited and you can die. Okay, there is that difference, yes. Yeah, and because that, <clears throat> that's again like a lot of comedy games will do like the uh the Bugs Bunny route and they just take the death out of it. Hmm. 
No, this one you still can, but again, because but fighting is is it tends to be more like high school fighting, right? So it's like fist fights or like like wedgies and stuff. There's rules for like knives and guns and that, but again, it 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 talks about that that kind of crosses a line into like something else. So it's it's not very right. common. Right, right, yeah, because you're supposed to be trying to have wacky hijinks, not kill each other in knife fights. Yeah, unless you want to play like the slasher version, which you totally could, and. and... Okay. So, so Don, is it closer to like Archie Comics, the role playing game? Is that kind of what it is? Oh, good God, no, no! It has like like random feel and grope tables and stuff. It's not Archie Comics. Again, it's 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 Animal House. It's one of those wacky teen sex comedies that were so popular in like the seventies and the eighties. Right. Hmm. Okay. So it's R rated Archie, the the uh, role playing game. Yeah, R rated or PG thirteen. Well, yeah, we could go. Okay, well there we go. But um, okay. Or life with Archie, or whatever they whatever they call oh. the matured up Archie. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, except that had like more violence and murder than the average Alamodder game is supposed to have. Okay, well there we go. <laughs> um, and so, but Alamodder, but it is still meant to be played like for for laughs. You are supposed you're sp- it's a serious game, but you're supposed to be trying to have some fun with it and do some wacky shit with it. Yeah, like I said, it comes into that weird nebulous thing that it's obviously drawing from comedy sources but because it's a really early role-playing game it still has that role-playing game mentality right so that yeah that it's still very like i said it's formal there's there's a lot of detail there's all kinds of charts and stuff which nowadays since we've had like the post narrativist thing in the 90s where you can do a, a looser game that it's it's less rules oriented it's kind of funny to read that today and and see that like it, it's perfectly playable you can run it but it's it's that look at a mentality that's very different from nowadays and like i say mm. to me that just kind of adds to the comedy value right right well i could see that it's yeah it would be very different from what we're used to today mm-hmm. and well okay well yeah okay but um that was however followed by as you said the only first one most people have heard of which of course is tune yeah which is basically the, as you might guess, the audience, the Bugs Bunny, uh, Warner Brothers role-playing game, basically. <laughs> I guess, or Disney. You could play Disney-style tunes with it. You could do whatever you want with it. It's tunes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but it was it was hard. It was really much uh, geared towards the old MGM, Tom and Jerry, mm. kind of violent comedy slapstick stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, the Disney cartoons are a little bit more heartful. That's why it's, you know. You can't really think too much aside from those goofy cartoons of like slapsticky Disney movie, like Disney shorts. You know what I mean? Right, right. Whereas you, you think of a, a character getting smashed in the head with a hammer, you go right to Warner Brothers or uh, Tom and Jerry. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, good point. Right, and, and that's and that's what it was trying to emulate. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, it did a pretty good job of it. Actually, to be honest. Um, like you played it with us a few times, didn't you, Rob? Like I, I know, I, um... I think I have vague memories of it. I do remember playing it, but I don't. I know, it, I know, I played it, but I don't really remember playing it. I should say. Okay, because I remember once running it, and I'm mm-hmm. I'm almost a hundred percent positive you were there. It was the one where I ran it as a Call of Cthulhu game. <laughs> so it's no, like it was a weird I don't, crossover. I don't remember that one. <laughs> okay, I'm pretty sure I wasn't there for that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> you ran it as a Call of Cthulhu game. How did that go? Well, off the rails very quickly. <laughs> I bet. But yeah, no, it's uh, they. I, I seem to recall that it, it's like they convince Cthulhu. Like it basically, Cthulhu comes back and is threatening to destroy the world, and then they convince him to work in like a in a, in a grocery store or something. It's really bizarre. <laughs> it really went off the rails, but that was the point, right? Well, yeah, that's that's half the fun. Um, okay. Because, yeah, it, Tune is, well, yeah, I don't think we need to describe it much more. The Game Master is called the Animator in Tune. Mm-hmm. Uh, players yeah. can't die, so you have no actual, um, you don't have to worry. You can be knocked out, but you can't die. That's, yeah, that's the, 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 yeah, the equivalent of health in that game was basically once it went to zero, your character was flattened or knocked out or whatever, and then, mm-hmm. they, you know, mm-hmm. you just had to wait a little bit and then come back. And then you were restored with full hit points as soon I believe as you woke so. up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you were. Yeah. Um, and then you yeah. Um you're just supposed to just dive in, have fun, and be as wacky as possible. 
But it's a good example of a game that can, again, uh, get out of control really fast. Mm. Um, mm. Because there ultimately is no repercussions to anything really that's long-lasting. Right. Mm. Characters can't die. That includes also the stuff you're going up against, right? So, mm. you know, they all just come back. Like, that's this is why when you're running a game like that, the goals have to be a little bit more overreaching than your typical role-playing game, which is, you know, kill the goblins and, yeah, I get experience. This is a very different animal. Mm-hmm. Right. Because you're you're dealing with, you know, opponents that, just like you, really can't die and be taken out of the game. Yeah. Really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. So you just have to kind so, of deal yeah. with them. Well, you have different goals. Yeah. Like, you, you, the goals become, like, a different thing entirely, and it's... Uh, it's not really a kill fest. Like, no, obviously, there's no, there's no point. There's literally no kill point. or survive. Well, or a survival fest because you survive pretty much everything. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And so the goal of the game, I guess, is just to you know just have as much fun and be as wacky as possible. Yeah. So the goal would be like, uh, you know, um, maintain a lemonade stand because, and then suddenly, like the the evil cor- the evil lemonade corporation opens across the street, mm-hmm. and now you have mm-hmm. to have a little war with them. That kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And come up with different ways to handle that. So, Don, did you run it? Uh, we played a little bit. We ended up, uh, they for some reason, they made like a group of squirrels that owned a spaghetti restaurant. Uh, okay, <laughs> that sounds like a good tune game. And as I, as I recall, Marky played the spaghetti. <laughs> so, but Marky always... Like someone played the actual spaghetti. Yeah, Marky always did weird things like that, so... Uh, okay. I obviously was not there for that one. Um, okay, so the... Okay. Someone played the spaghetti. I'm not sure yeah. how that works exactly. <laughs> really odd. Because again, it's, it's it's like Chad was saying, like, there's no consequence to anything, so you can make, like, a really bizarre character. Mm-hmm. And then just kind of find stuff for them to do. Um right. So, because it's you've seen it in cartoons, a little ambulance spaghetti, and I think it had like two meatballs oh, yeah. for eyes and stuff. And oh yeah, I mean that kind of there <laughs> every food commercial with animated food or something like that. Of course, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, that would be like making the talking M M&M and M guys or something like that. Mm-hmm. So no, it's it ambient food is okay. I mean, hell, there's sausage <laughs> party, right? Uh... <laughs> that's that's what happens when you combine tune and alma mater. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, now right. you, that is actually now it makes sense. <laughs> Whoa, dude. Okay, yeah, yep. Good point. Good yeah, cause, point. Because that's the other thing too with a lot of comedy games that make them different from from other other role playing games. And there's one that I, I I'm hoping we get to talk about coming up that really stresses this. But it's mm. the idea that as a player, you need to be a little more self motivated, right? And when you make your character, you have to really kind of hang that character on some kind of hook. Like there has to be a, an overreaching theme or an idea to your character because you're not going to get a lot of definition from the, from the story. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to have to come from you playing the character and your own ideas and wackiness. Yeah. And and that idea too, it's, it's like when you look at... um. Yeah, like you look at like the Warner Brothers characters, they'll have like a catchphrase, but it's something that sums that character up pretty pat. Like it, it does it effectively because you're dealing with, I wouldn't necessarily say one note characters, but they have one or two very pronounced traits that everything else comes from. Right. Yeah. Extreme traits, which is kind yeah. Of the point. Yeah, and then and that's what you need for for a comedy game because, like Chad was saying too, things are going to get way off the rails. And mm-hmm. un- unless you have, and it sounds so weird to say this, a very clear concept of your character, that character is going to get washed away in the tide. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Here's two weird factoids about Toon for you. Mm-hmm. Factoid number one, the person who came up with the idea for Toon was actually Jeff D., one of the co-creators oh. of the Vigil- Villains of Vigilantes role-playing game. Makes an odd sense. <laughs> um, he came up with the concept, but... He didn't actually develop it because he said that it was something that was pretty much impossible to design. Uh-huh. He told this to a guy named Greg Kostikian. Oh, okay. And Greg Kostikian then decided to make it anyway. And mm-hmm. so the result was Toon. 
Okay? Cost, it was released in 1984. Costikian's other game, Paranoia, was also released in, 19, <laughs> in 1984. That Double makes irony sense. there. Yeah. Actually, I just realized <clears throat> Paranoia was released in 1984. Oh. <laughs> I didn't, that didn't, actually didn't occur to me. Oh, oh. Um, actually, here's a weird thing. Costikian himself, by the way, is also the designer of the original Star Wars role-playing game from 87. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And is the designer of, from 1979, The Creature That Ate Sheboygan, the original oh, okay. kaiju um, board game thingy. Okay, like, yeah. Qual- qualifies a micro game. Yeah, he did a lot. He's he's one of those guys, if you look at role-playing games, he's done usually something odd. Yeah, a lot of the more offbeat games, he was involved with on some level, if not yeah. the actual creator of them. Yeah. Yeah, Greg Kostikian had made some huge effects on role-playing games. Anything else we want to say about Toon before we move on? Um, the only one I think I can relate is a, a story. Uh, do you remember Adam, the guy, one of the guys we used to play in our group? Of course, yeah. His, his yeah, his brother ran one. And I've only heard about this, but I thought it was fu- it was just a funny story where they said, yeah, him and his friends mm-hmm. were playing it one night and drinking at the same time, <laughs> uh-huh. so the game became more surreal. And and I said, really, how, how did it become more serious? He goes, well, it started off just kind of typical, and then it turned into they the, the characters created World War Three. They caused it to happen, <laughs> and they were being chased around by like radioactive mutant food. <laughs> and he goes, they don't remember much past that. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's the thing about Tune. It is definitely one of those games that you could play drunk and or high, and it would probably be even better. Well, you can do that with any yeah. game. I was going to say, any game will work, but comedy games especially tend to lend themselves to this sort of thing. Well, comedy are dramatic, because we have a lot of good uh, sleep deprivation Warhammer 40k stories. Okay, there is that. Yeah, so... Sleep deprivation can also, yeah, that's produced many a uh, fun gaming experience. Mm-hmm. That's definitely <laughs> true. Okay, so actually, we should probably go on. There's another game I often pair with with uh, Toon. Uh-huh. Um, this is the one that I preferred because, you know, I'm the anime guy. So I often think of Teenagers from Outer Space. Mm. And that's the one that I actually ran more than a couple times, actually. In fact, for a while there, I would run a Teenagers from Outer Space game as a kind of New Year's event for <laughs> about, about good five or six years, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. I, w- I would run it for my groups as a, just a one-shot New Year's event. Because Teenagers from Outer Space, or TFOS as it's known, is definitely a game for one shots, just like Toon. Real, you're not meant to campaign these things. You're meant to just play them once, go through some weird scenario, let things go off the rails, have fun, laugh, and go home. Oh, you can do. We 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 did a teenagers campaign, and then Dope broke it, and now we can't play anymore. Okay, well we'll get to that story in a second. <laughs> Let's just cover what Teenagers Murder Space is first. Okay. Um, Teenagers Murder Space is, well, yeah, as we we kind of already kind of covered in a way. You're you're playing high schoolers, kind of. At a high school where there are like aliens have come down and are now high school students and such. Mm -hmm. Um, It's here. It's Yurisei Yatsura. It's Lum, the role playing game, basically. Um, It literally is. It's meant, it's, you know, it's meant to be, you know, this weird high school experience where, and the players can play aliens that are, look like whatever you want them to look like. Um, They can be mutant teddy bears or uh i've seen characters that were ghetto blasters i've seen look like, or look like ghetto blasters i've seen characters that could be anything and everything mm-hmm. um and your your goal in the game is usually to be as cool as possible and let's see what did i usually do often i would have the characters like assigned um tasks Mm-hmm. Like they would actually would need something in order to accomplish that thing. Usually what I do is I'd have them do a weird task. Like, for example, they had to get the hottest girl in the school to go out with like this, like, uh, things like that. Mm-hmm. And who is really shy and things like that. And so, you know, you got, so you got the characters to actually be um, like, in this case, they're playing almost the fairy godmothers trying to convince each person to go out with the other and make sure the date's a success, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so you set up we'll see you set up scenarios like that and then you just kind of let it run at least that's how i did it and it was mm-hmm. cute i mean people would have fun again most of the comedy just came from just the weird wackiness of the situation yeah and how it inevitably went completely off the rails and got really weird mm-hmm. um there was another time i think where i actually even had two of the 
PCs actually play villains, or mm-hmm. they were the the opponents, and mm-hmm. that went horribly, horribly <laughs> off the rails. Actually, if I remember right, in fact, actually, I think the I think the two PCs in questions might have been Chad and Chad and my our friend Ron. In fact, <laughs> I remember actually, I do remember that one because basically, I was I was playing an evil little rich kid. Yep, and Don was playing an evil Teddy Ruxpin. Oh, sorry, not Don. Sorry, Ron. Yeah. Sorry, Ron. Ron, and Ron yeah. was playing an evil Teddy Ruxpin, and I because he mentioned that one before, and um, and so they and it was one of those things situations where I learned very quickly that um, and we never talked about this really the, the whole idea of having um, how can I put this PC opponents like you mm-hmm. know having PCs actually play the 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 opposition or, or whoever the bad guys generally never goes well. <laughs> um because what you inevitably end up happening have happening is usually the PC bad guys will usually mop the floor with the group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cuz Don and I still I'm sorry, Ron and I just basically teamed up and then just started messing with everybody. <laughs> yep. And and Ron turned out to be like sort of actually kind of terrifyingly good at doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like he would do, he would do weird crap. Like he'd go, Rob, uh, I just got to tell you something secret. So he'd walk, he'd walk Rob around the corner out of the, out of the earshot of everyone. And then he would just turn to Rob and go, so how's it going? <laughs> and yeah. he'd just kind of waste everyone's, and then he'd come back in and everyone's wondering what the hell he's doing. Like what's, what's he, well, he's clearly up to something. We're just not sure what. Yep. He wasn't doing anything. <laughs> so in that sense, that actually turned into a game of paranoia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much turned into a game. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Space uh, was by uh, Artel Sorian Games, yeah. who are also famous for Mech Ton and Cyberpunk 2020. Well, yeah. Cyberpunk in 2020, um, and this w- almost all of which have an anime feel. And this was their fun, you know, funny anime game. Which again, I suppose is probably why I related to it. It was supposed to have a slightly more serious bent to it than Tune. I mean, as someone who never was a huge like. Warner Brothers, you know, Tom and Jerry fan. I mean, I watched them as a kid, but I wasn't that obsessed with them or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I could definitely appreciate the Teenage Mutant Space idea. Right. And so it definitely worked for me. Um, but okay, so let's get to it. So, Don, <laughs> why can't you play Teenage Mutant Space? I want to hear this one. <laughs> it's it's kind of the same thing with you guys. Um, it, it was because of Doke. Mm-hmm. We rolled up characters, and we we played for a little bit. And he ended up making a character. Um, if anybody here is like an old school Warhammer fan, you'd remember the miniatures. They did a pack of uh, familiars for your Chaos Wizards, and one of them he's this like little tiny jester guy, looks like Punch, and he's carrying like a, a big slapstick with a little puppet on it. And don't pick that. And he said, "This is gonna be my character." And he was like the little brother of one of the other other guys. I think it was Stanchu. He's actually his little brother. And he he rolled this amazing combination. It was like he had dexterity, he had like lightning speed, and teleport. Uh huh. And Doak just got it in his head. He was going to mess with the entire group and completely like put the kibosh on anything they wanted to do. And he did. And you have to remember, Doak is a professional comedian. Yeah, now he is. Yeah, you know, back back then he was he was he was a, he, he was an amateur, but he was he, an amateur comedian. Now he's a pro. Yeah, but back then you knew where this was going to go. You knew one day this man was going to be like irritating people on a world stage somewhere. <laughs> uh, you, and right. if you play this kind of game with somebody who's like 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 a pro like that, mm-hmm. it takes on this whole crazy thing. And I didn't do anything. I was game mastering. I did nothing the whole game except sit back and basically watch Doke ruin everything that anybody anywhere wanted to do. And right. he got into character, so he made the little giggling noises, and he'd roll around and jump around the room and stuff. And yeah, he after after the, this one big marathon game, mm-hmm. he basically won. He won the teenagers from outer space role playing game, and now we never we can never play ever again. Right, just because he he had perfected it, he did the perfect game basically, and you just can't yeah. do that. Yeah, he he, yeah. he he bowled a 300. And then the problem is anybody who was there, if you even mentioned Teenagers from Outer Space, they start to twitch and foam because they have flashbacks and PTSD from this big giant game where Doak basically won. Right. Okay. 
which is in outer space though great game it really is they're they're up they're they're up to third edition now oh they're still putting it out i i third edition i think came out in like the early 2000s i don't know if they've done one after okay the the diff take a quick look Uh, yeah outer space um, the last one, it looks like, came out in 1997. Okay. So, here's a scary thought. That means it's 20 years old. Wow, it graduated. <laughs> it did, actually. It's now graduated. It's now, you. Um, what is it? College students from outer space is what it should be called. Um, well, the first one came out in 87. So, mm-hmm. actually, it's, it's actually 30 years old, if you want to be technical about it. Mm-hmm. So now it's like office workers from outer space. Yep. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's true. It's called the office. From outer space, yeah, actually, actually, is he paint one of those guys blue? There, mm-hmm. there you go. Which I think kind of they did in an episode, didn't they? Something like that. Hmm. Yeah, world All comes right. full circle. <clears throat> Although t- teenage from outer space or TFOS definitely um, had more of the Archie thing going on with it, though. Like, the if you f- played it straight up, it was supposed to be more, a little more like Archie. Well, the, the first two editions did. The, all three editions aren't that different. When they did the mm. third, the third has kind of more of an anime sensibility about it. Mm. The mechanics are the same, but they sort of mix up the sample characters and how everything works. Because, yeah, the closest I can think mm-hmm. was in the 80s. There was a, uh, there was a, a TV show called Galaxy High School. Right. If that was taking place on Earth, that would be the Teenagers from Outer Space game. Well, it's TFOS, except it's in reverse, right? Yeah. I mean, they, the human kids go to an alien high school. Yeah. But except for that, it's Teenagers from Outer Space. It's exactly yeah. Teenagers from Outer Space. Yeah, the, the the way it plays out, the types of stories, the types of characters, the sensibility, that's what the game is. Yep. I'll be sure to put a link to Galaxy High somewhere in the show notes for people to go check that out. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. So, um, what would be the next one? Well, Don, you pick. What good game from the list do you want to talk about next? Wow. Okay. We're going to probably go way out of order for, for when it happens because, again, there was never any real big wave of comedy games. They just kind of pop up every now and then. Right. Uh, but what I think, what I think I'd like to talk about, it's actually a newer one, is, oh, okay. uh, would be the uh, Cartoon Action Hour. Specifically, uh, Season 3. Okay, well, tell us about Cartoon Action Hour, and then why Season 3? Okay, it's it's a, a, a role-playing game designed around, if you remember, like, your 80s kind of action toy commercial cartoons. Mm-hmm. And Season 3 specifically, it's the third edition of the game. It's the one that captures the feel the most. Like, the, the first two editions... Um, I'm not super familiar with. I've I've read stuff from them. They're a little still a little gamerish, right? But when you get to the the third edition, the the, the actual mechanics are more subjective. So wait a sec. So when they say season three, they're actually mean third edition. That's yeah. really what season three means. Okay. So yeah. I just thought there might be a difference between, but it's just the editions. Okay, got it. Yeah, but the mechanics are very different for each one. Right. Like I say, the the okay. the season three are really stripped down. Um, but it, like, again, because of that, they capture the feel. Essentially what you do is every character has, um, you have a couple of defining traits. Mm-hmm. Um, you have like talents or abilities, which will have a numerical rating. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you do something, there'll be a difficulty. You drop a dice. I, you add the appropriate, like, um. If you have a talent or ability that fits, if you roll higher, hooray, if you don't, boo. And then your specific traits, like if, if my character is tough guy, prince of the tough guys, prince of the tough guys would be a trait. I can okay. spend, I can spend that during the game to get a bonus to an appropriate dice roll. Okay. And it's set up really loosely. So what you can do, if you can stretch credulity till it cries to get that extra bonus, yeah, sure. Add it on. Right. Because it's it's all about again, it's presentation. It's it's keeping that narrative mm-hmm. going and the the third edition system really really fits that. Um it's fun, it's funny. When they did their supplements, uh they come up with backstories for the show. Right. 
because the premise is it's supposed to be like a TV show. So they did um, uh, Warriors of the Cosmos, I believe it is. Is there? It's like a He Man kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they do it by season, and then like the sidebars and and the notes will talk about. Well, this character was added because the studio wanted this and the company making the toys. And they come up with these whole crazy stories, which I think just adds to the effect. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, and you're supposed to just play straight up, you know, cartoon action, 80s cartoon action hour um, stories and everything and uh, just have fun with it. Yeah, and it's it really does, it. they keep the theme. So, for instance, you never die. If you get, like, hit, you get a setback. Mm-hmm. Right. And if, if they supersede your star power, then you're kind of temporarily stymied. Like you're, ca- you're captured, right. you're, you're knocked unconscious, the bad guys get away, all that kind of thing. Right. And it, it encourages that kind of silliness too. So they, they add rules like um, the violence level. Right. And if you want to crank it way down, you're doing like, say, uh, like a Saturday morning version, mm-hmm. then you can never like shoot somebody. Okay. But I can shoot a tree behind them, a branch hits them and knocks them out, and then the game is set up, you have what's called right. oomph. Oomph works kind of like luck, and I can spend a point of oomph to say, but there's a tree, which is oddly drawn slightly different from the rest of the background. Behind that guy, I'm going to aim for it. Right, right. And then there's rules for if you want to play whatever campaign, the movie, well, in the movie, people can die. Right. And they That's up that... Funny. But you can spend a point for them, you know. Oh, Rob's character's not dead! Yay! And everybody cheers. It'll in be joke. a voiceover at the end. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah you can. <laughs> and it really captures that idea. And again, if you had somebody who's into that sort of stuff and willing mm. to run with it, yeah, it'd be it would be like a, a hell of a lot of fun. It's a good game. Well, yes, okay, pretty much for children of the '80s. But yeah, yeah, that would um, that would definitely be a fun game. Mm. Okay. Okay. Very cool. And so I guess, yeah, that, that makes sense. That works. Um, mm-hmm. So after uh, Cartoon Action Hour, then what other, you know, comedy role-playing games do you think are worth talking about? Oh, there's a bunch. You guys got any uh, suggestions? Um, uh, well, we did. We, we talked about the Ghostbusters one. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we did the horror the one. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, there is, you know, here's a question. Would the Judge Dredd role playing game actually count as a comedy role playing game? <laughs> See that that's that's one I put that in like the pseudo category because it's deathly serious, emphasis on the death part. Mm. But the setting and, and the, the concepts are over the top and meant to be parody. Very true. Also your characters don't die very easily, if I remember right. The Judge Dredd role playing game, the judges are pretty tough. They are, but you can you can definitely get in over your head. You can, yeah, yeah. You can get in over your head, but it but you can wade into some pretty nasty stuff and actually manage to get through it. Yeah. Um. So and so there is meant to be a certain, I guess, parody kind of comedy. But I guess you're right. I guess it's more the environment that's meant to be funny and parody. You, of course, being judges, are supposed to be incredibly straight laced. Hmm. Which is part I, of the I gag. Assume. Yeah, it's part of the yeah. gag, exactly. But you're dealing with just really funny situations instead. Mm-hmm. And then that, that kind of puts more of the onus, if you're doing like that kind of setting, on the mm-hmm. Game Master. Because the Game Master has to come up with stuff that's wacky. Like if you've ever read the comic. Right. The comic, the, the way they do it is they'll take something small or something just bizarre and yeah, blow it way up to out of proportions that hundreds of people die because of it. Mm, mm. There, there's a yeah. story, there's a series mm-hmm. in, in the comic where uh, somebody hits dread with a pie. Right. And it leads to like mob wars and thousands of bodies and <laughs> incredible amounts of property damage. But that's how it's supposed to work. It's, it's again, that thing that like Chad was saying, the story is right. supposed to go off the rails at some point. Right. Okay. That makes a certain amount of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, huh. Well, yeah, I get it's that was the whole point. Judge Dredd is supposed to be parroting social um I don't want to say injustices, but yeah, social issues and things like that and fads and other stupid things about society. 
Right. So it's it's a satire game more than a comedy game. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right. So let's see what else. Um, classic. Well, there is. Uh, speaking of satire games, uh, let's see. There's a few other classics in that vein. For example, Macho Women with Guns. Mm-hmm. I would classify that also as a satire game because I mean you're supposed to be playing you know, uh, well, be action movie characters who of course are you know, macho <laughs> women with guns. Yeah. Um, but in these macho women with guns situations, but ultimately you're just playing through Schwarzenegger movies and such. You're just doing it as like incredibly stacked hot chicks mm-hmm. um, with with bad attitudes. Yeah, that as I recall, so, as I recall, they say the stories all take place in the macho verse. In the macho version, yeah. okay. <laughs> there we go. Um, hmm. Chad, do you do you remember any other comedy role playing games you want to talk about? Um, actually, what I did want to talk about was where you draw the line at a, I guess, like a comedy game and just an oddball game. Like, for example, Gamble World. Really, if you go back to the early mm-hmm. Gamble World editions Mm -hmm. it's pretty tongue-in-cheek in in a lot of ways even though despite the fact that it's this kind of uh at times a very glum post-apocalyptic game with you know radiation sickness and whatnot but then you also get like mutant Mm -hmm. badgers that worship uh, (laughs) a long a a long gone um baseball mascot that just happened to be a cartoon badger Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like it's so it's this weird, like, where do you draw the line, I guess? Because, you know, like, things like, um, we were talking about this just before the show started, like, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is very odd, mm. the actual uh, the actual role-playing yes. game. But it's not really a comedy game, mm-hmm. per se. You know, it's not, it's not really made for yucks, and the characters can die, but there's a lot of really oddball elements in it. I remember even in that the original game there was the uh the the evil little bears that were based off the care bears oh the, right. yeah the, the terror bears the terror bears yeah. yes yeah. yeah which is you know it's it's it, it has a goofiness to it but then at the same time the uh the uh weren't they also trying to cause like world war three as i recall yes, in the game like one of the adventures was trying to get them to stop them from uh causing a nuclear uh, war but yeah well, that's what i mean so where do you draw i guess the line as to when it gets, you know, what you consider to be like a lighthearted, goofy game, and then something that's just got oddness to it. Because even Judge Dredd has that; mm-hmm. it, it straddles that line, right? Right. That's very true. <clears throat> yeah. That... Like Don, I mean, I think you had mentioned that you had had sort of a, a sort of a take on this. Yeah, because this is it, it. You're getting at what um, what I was inelegantly talking about at the beginning that that sort of thing, especially like say the Gamma World, it hits. Yeah, that that gamer comedy, that like nerdly humor that it's very serious, but it has all these weird little nods and little asides and things that if you're in the know or paying attention, you go, oh, okay, that's kind of funny. Like the idea of, uh, you mentioned uh, where we talked about Game World the first time, the one adventure that the guy has a shield that it's made out of a stop sign. Mm. Right. Well, that's that's kind of like the the joke that keeps giving when you think about it, because it's funny because oh, he's he's reappropriated a sign as as a defensive item and anything, but it's a stop sign and it's supposed to stop attacks. And then you picture him charging into combat, bracing for the enemy, and he holds up the stop sign, and it's it it just keeps getting funny. It's that weird kind of kind of meta wit to it. And I think yeah, that's that's one of the reasons I think. Um, you get so few straight up comedy games because hmm. that kind of 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 wit and in joke appeals more to the typical gamer than like you know the three stooges pie in the face sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I can and, see that. Mm-hmm. And and you're right that there's there's a lot of that sort of thing in 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 different games in that. Yeah, and it just, I guess it just comes down to, uh, I guess, where the line in the sand is, mm-hmm. uh, as to, like, how far does it go? Like, I look at something like, you know, you look at something like um, uh, Bunnings and Burrows. Right. Mm. There's a good one. Which yeah. was, I, I guess, more or less was, what, Watership Down the game? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, did it, but curiously, have you ever played that? Yep. You did? Yes. Was there, like, because it is based on uh, Watership Down, is there a pathos <laughs> stat? <laughs> No, it, it must be. No, it it does a weird thing because it's it's Watership Down crossed with early D anD D. 
Mm-hmm. Mm. And and again, the Bunnies and Burrows game is really old. I think first edition is like 78 or 79. Right, right. And it draws from D&D because you're rabbits, but there's different classes of rabbit. So they're like the seers. If if you're a seer, they get like, uh, you can get premonitions in that. There's like, um, oh, there's, they're, they're like alchemists. They can make like certain herbs in that, which not to a great degree because you're still a rabbit. Right. Yeah. There's like a fighter. That whole, uh, that whole lack of opposable thumb thing. Yeah. You can get by because they do say like, um, if you see the pictures, they have these weird little like wicker basket backpack things. Uh huh. So they do give you a little bit of manipulative ability, but yeah, you're not gonna like use a pistol or open a open a lock or anything. Mm-hmm. But it it does the weird thing for adding pathos that you keep you have to keep track of your 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 character's energy level. Mm-hmm. And they don't specifically say this, but an, a, a first level character is pretty much like a newborn because you're helpless because. Based on your character level is how much energy you can store. And you get energy oh. from, from time spent eating. Okay. And there's That's diff- right, because you're herbivores, so you'd constantly be eating. Yeah, and there's different things, like lettuce gives you more energy than, like, say, like, oats would. And, and, and there's rules for that, but at first level, you can store enough energy. Basically, mm-hmm. a character can, like, walk 100 meters that way and then fall asleep, you know? Oh, which, which means if you encounter anything, it's just going to eat you. Okay. Wow. <laughs> like it's, wow, that's weird. It is. It's it's a very, it's a very, and and the idea being that if you're running it, you should pr- probably have like a, a higher level, like at least third or fourth, I think, um, level character that's like the 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 caretaker for the group mm-hmm. until they get high enough, because that's that's at the early stages. That's the thing that that does you in the most is running out of energy. Okay. That's really odd, but that's like, yeah, see, I wouldn't even count this now as like a... That's definitely <laughs> a, a, a comedy game. That sounds no. like a horror survival game. <laughs> yeah, really. It is, but but it goes, wow. to, it goes to your point that, especially for role-playing games, defining that is so difficult because role-playing games, you tell stories, but you're telling them the opposite way around from a, like a movie or a novel. Right. Mm-hmm. So if I'm writing a book, I'll say I'm writing a horror book and I know what to add, but any role playing game can turn into a horror story really quickly, whether you want it. Ask the guys who played that final teenagers from outer space game with, with, uh, with dope. Right. Like yeah. I yeah, I <laughs> see it into a horror game. Yeah. <laughs> and it did. And, and it's, and it's, it's one of the interesting things about the hobby is, yeah, that you get these weird sort of blurrings of different lines in that. Hmm. But it's the, it can go the same way. I mean, a horror game can turn into a comedy game very easily as well. Yes, they can. Depending on what happens, and they occasionally do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, I guess that's the truth, is that depending on how what the mood of the group and the situation, everything, I mean, any game can be played almost any style. It's just how we want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and how the group wants to do it or not. I mean, some of this happens by accident, not on purpose very often. In fact, it's not on purpose. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But I guess <laughs> a game, comedy game would be one that's intended where the characters are supposed to be goofy, just to answer Chad's question. I think that one criteria I find for most, it's not, I guess, a criteria for a comedy game, but I find is comedy games are super forgiving. Yeah. And that's one of the things I'd actually note about them, which means they're the exact opposite of Bunnies and Burrows, as we just mentioned, <laughs> which is, horribly unforgiving whereas comedy games you either can't die in them or they've just made lots and lots of room for you to make mistakes and to have fun and not really worry so much about the whole survival aspect of the game yeah <clears throat> that's probably a good way to sum it up yeah i mean and they're, they're also doing other things to facilitate the humor in some ways sometimes it's very simple things like just having humor skills and wacky abilities or stuff and sometimes it's a weird quasi humor situation, like paranoia, for example. I guess. Yeah. Um, at least that's how I look at it as far as comedy games go. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, so 
so a game like Ghostbusters, as we mentioned before, can be a hom- comedy game. I suppose you could actually run it as a straight-up horror game, and it might still work, actually, as one. Although, again, it's meant to be very forgiving, so the players aren't really um, too worried about dying. They're more worried about, you know, just kind of having fun and getting, you know, getting through the whole thing. Well, and yeah. again, it goes back to what Don had said, where you, you put this overreaching goal, because in Ghostbusters, the characters had you know, specific goals that they were supposed to drive their character around. So, right. you know, like, like one character wants to make money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it's almost like the ghost busting aspect of it almost weirdly becomes an odd way secondary. <laughs> Which is not a bad way to do it, actually. I mean, it, yeah. it gives you a clear no. goal for the game. And so you're, you're good. That's your shtick basically is that the, I'm the greedy guy who's always trying to con people and make money. Well, okay. Exactly, and that's why, if you remember in that game, the, the rules for the actual busting of ghosts was pretty loosey-goosey. <laughs> right. Like, it wasn't really this, okay, you have to do these specific things, you have to roll this way. No, it was kind of really open-ended to, uh, mm-hmm. it was kind of more like the bigger story going on kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I could totally see that. And that and that makes, that makes sense, and I think that would be a ton of fun as well. Mm-hmm. I think that would be... Well, yeah, just, uh, I guess maybe it's supposed to be more... Um, interactive like we were talking earlier as well about that Baron Munchausen game right and the, but as I said I'm you know I'm debating whether the Baron Munchausen game counts I'll explain it to people the Baron Munchausen game is a kind of weird party game uh, it's based off the movie slash I guess legend story whatever of Baron Munchausen um, I'm I because Baron Munchausen is not a legend, is he? Or was Baron Munchausen a real person? Let, let's just back this up for a sec. Anyone know? What's the deal with Baron no, Munchausen? No, he was... He, he apparently was based off of a real guy who used to go around basically telling tall tales. And then uh, they got published... Uh, like, they got published somewhere. Right. But he... I think he was an actual person, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Okay, because that would make sense. Because I think there's even, like, Munchausen syndrome or something like that. Where yes. you're a person who just tells endless tall tales and basically just never stops lying basically Mm -hmm. Um, anyway so the Baron Munchausen game you are supposed to play a bunch of characters that exist now Munchausen himself sorry to go for another side I think existed in either the 1700s or 1800s like he's not a modern figure no 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 it's I actually just looked it up on Wikipedia real uh, real quick the the character is loosely based off a real Baron Mm -hmm. Hieronymus Carl Frederick uh, von Munchausen. Okay. Uh, 1720 to 1797. Okay. So. And that makes sense because you it's a role-playing game in the sense that you are supposed to have a group of people, uh, you're the players, there's no GM, who basically sit around a table and each of you is supposed to be playing a Munchausen-like person from a from that era like you're you're not modern you're supposed to be back in the 1700s or whatever okay and you're all telling tall tales and each person is basically telling about some great and amazing adventure that they had okay the object of the game is to tell the tallest tale you can po- possibly tell and also the most entertaining obviously in the process okay so it's basically it's kind of like a storytelling game with a role playing aspect now, what makes it amusing is every character has money, although it's usually done with chits. You don't actually do it with real money, though you could do it with pennies if you want. Okay, everyone, everyone starts off with, I think, like 30 pennies or 30 chits, whatever. They're supposed to represent doubloons. I'm sorry, what, what, what's a penny, Rob? <laughs> oh, yes, I know. Sorry, I forgot. There might be some millennials missing and listening. Um, it's a very small unit of money, Chad. <laughs> Back in the old days. <laughs> anyway. I think they were made out of wood. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wood or steel or something like that. Yeah, yeah okay. Anyway. Um, so the key point here is that uh, as you're telling your tall tale, people can actually push money at you. So let's say, for example, someone pushes um, two doubloons at you. Uh, as you're telling this tale about how you... Uh, made love to this, you know, beautiful barmaid. And they might say something like, well, as you were about to make love to the girl, I heard that uh, her boyfriend showed up. And at that point, you have two choices. You can either slide his money back, but you have to double it. Okay, so if he slid two across at you, you'd have to slide four back to him and say, 
no, 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 you heard wrong and continue with your story. Or you have to incorporate whatever it is that they said into the into your story and you just accept the money. Mm. And the, right, which then can be used for that per like to use against somebody else. Which then can be used in their to, story. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and and so this game goes on with the rest of the group trying to mess you up as much as possible. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. It's an incredible amount of fun. And then what happens is when you reach the end of your story, your story just reaches a natural end. You're not supposed to go on for an hour. You're supposed to do this maybe like 15, 20 minutes and it goes on to the next person. And then when you're done, you you know, you take a bow, you stand, you take a bow, and the rest of the group usually gives you some money in appreciation for your story. Okay, so mm -hmm. people will give you a, a tip basically. Everyone will give you a tip of a few, you know, a few doubloons as they call them in trade for, you know, giving a good tale. And um, then at the end of the game, once everyone's said and done, if I remember right, the person who has the most money is technically the winner of the game. But if you're playing in an actual bar or something like that, they are actually supposed to buy a round of drinks for everyone else hmm. oh. with real money. <laughs> so you won the game, but to show that you were an incredibly good sport and everything, you're supposed to actually buy everyone a round of drinks or something like that. I've never mm. actually played oh, it at a bar, but good. you could for real. Right. And, it would, and that would be a lot of fun, actually. Um, everyone's supposed to buy the last round of drinks or whatever. And it it's a role-playing game only in the loosest sense that you're supposed to be playing in this 17th century setting. Your mm. characters never really have names. They're just supposed to be you under another circumstance. Right. Um, now, I have done it once where we were playing uh, the game Weapons of the Gods. Uh, this is my with my friend Graham, who's been on the show once. And Graham was running a Weapons of the Gods campaign, which is basically a Chinese wuxia fantasy role-playing game. Okay? And so everyone... We basically played Munchausen, except everyone was supposed to be their, you know, massive kung fu hero character in the game. <laughs> and they were all telling about a great adventure that they had. And that was actually very cool because in a weird way, it ended up being kind of like your characters were revealing their pasts by basically having a Tall Tales contest. Huh. And that was a really weird and interesting um, addition to uh, a game. But normally you wouldn't play it that way. But you could, as, a, mm. as you obviously just saw, you could play it that way as, a, as actual characters. But normally you play just kind of yourselves, sort of, but in a 17th century setting. And again, oh, tons of fun. I don't even know if it's still in print, but the Baron Munchausen um, role, it's a storytelling game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be the Baron Munchausen storytelling game is it's awesome. In fact, I'm going to look it up right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's called the Extraordinary Adventures of Baron Munchausen. That's what the game's called. Yep. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> is it still in print? Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. hmm. Oh, 2016 Fantasy Flight Games released a new third edition of the book, mm. and I can totally understand why. The book itself is not that thick. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, no. <laughs> it's, it's you. Know, generally speaking, I mean, they list the playing time as forty-five minutes. I've oh, it, it, that will heavily depend on your group. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have a group that are heavily into um, if that are like dramatic storytellers, it could go on for hours. <laughs> um, but I've found most groups, to be honest, going back to the idea that most gamers are introverts and getting them to do comedy is hard, getting them to suddenly spontaneously be do improv storytelling is not exactly easy either. Yeah. Um, oh, and I see here, like I'm just looking at a, a quick rundown of it. Mm -hmm. It looks to me like there's <clears throat> the adventures are basically your starting point of your of your story. Yes. <laughs> Right, so it gives a bunch of like, tell us about the time that you defeated all the Turks with a with a broken bottle. Yes, like it's that kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. I forgot to mention that. Yes, you can do it that way. Um, they're like we'll call it starter, but they're not really adventures. They're just kind of like a starter sentence, pretty much, and you just have to go from there. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and you don't have to use that. I mean, if your players are good enough, then that's you know that's the way you do it anyway. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, no, amazing game. And um, I, again, highly recommend anyone who has the chance to actually try the Baron Munchausen game, try it out. It is fantastic, especially with the right group of people. 
In fact, actually, I hear, for me, I will label that as my favorite comedy role-playing game if it counts as a role-playing game. If not, then Teenage Murder Space. But uh, hmm. Baron Munchausen would be my first choice. Huh. Just because it's so darn fun. But then again, I actually enjoy like improv storytelling, so I'm a little bit biased. If you don't enjoy <laughs> that kind of thing, you might not enjoy Munchausen quite as much. But, you know, it is just fun, especially if you've got a group that knows you and you're relaxed. That's the other thing. It would be hard for many people to play with a group of strangers. But if mm. you know the group you're with and feel comfortable, it's okay. Right. Huh. Hmm. All right. So, um, so on that note, are there any other role? Uh, I was going to say horror. Are there any other? <laughs> game, uh, are there any other comedy role playing games we want to discuss today? Uh, let me think of any of because some of them we already covered. Like uh, it came from Late 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 Show. Yeah. Yeah, we covered that previously. Um, um, same with a lot of them, actually. GURPS IOU and um, some of the goofier versions of Chill. Mm-hmm. Of yeah, <laughs> yeah, we kind of covered that. We didn't cover GURPS IOU, though. Because GURPS IOU is talk- basically GURPS, what is it, if I'm correct, Illuminati University, which is basically, yeah. it's GURPS um, college students from outer space, basically, if I remember right. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm just, I'm confusing it with um. Oh, what was the other GURPS one? It was 4? like the uh, what? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> yeah, because GURPS IOU yeah is basically university students from outer space. You're playing yeah. a like the whole point is it's supposed to be a university setting for GURPS where what's the best way to describe it? You know, I mean, you could have monsters and like weird. Super, super science, basically, stuff going on mm-hmm. um, at the university. I think that's mostly the idea. It's like, yeah, you know, you're, you're going to get the daughter of the mad scientist going to school with the with Bigfoot and yeah. um, a gray and things like that. You know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. Um, we didn't One we didn't talk about that's been around for a long time, actually, is Attack of the Humans. Oh, yeah. That one I'm not familiar with. I've heard of it, but I've never actually played it. Really? I'm sure you have. <laughs> Attack of the Humans is a good one. Um, it's an unhorror game. Okay. The idea is there's monsters and, and, and that, but humanity kind of outclasses them. That they, they give you this timeline that it, it cycles, that the monsters have an edge and then the humans get it. And the monster, and at the time it takes place, the modern era, humans tend to have the the edge. Okay. It's another one you ha- you kind of have to have the right group. Okay. It's a lot of fun. One of the weird things is when you make your character, you don't really pick your skills. You randomly roll for them. Mhm. And cuz we had a one adventure the um nobody had navigation. Uh-huh. And they were like trying to drive to the mall and they got lost and they ended up in like this secret arctic military base. Because right. they just they just kept flubbing the rule <laughs> like the role worse and worse, and nobody had any like skill to find their way. So yeah, they eventually ended up and they where they were doing experiments with like captured aliens and stuff. And yeah, Attack of the Humans is it's uh it's it's another one of one of them weird sort of hybrids because it does kind of have rules. They're pretty loose, and there's consequence, but. Again, because you outclass most of your, except for I think it was was it the, there's the giant radioactive lizard, I forget what his name is, but he's kind of hard to beat. But yeah, and it, okay, and it, so there's no actual challenge to beating the monsters. I mean, you play humans, right? Yeah, and you're basically just beating up monsters. There is, but what you do when you come up with the adventures for that one is, it's not like say a horror game where the idea is here's a monster, you have to beat that monster. It ends up being like, here's something you have to do. The monster's kind of getting in your way. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So the monster's almost like a weird obstacle. To... Yeah. Oh, okay. that's very odd. It's almost... Like, can you like, roll off an example, Rug Dog? Because I'm still having a hard time kind of <laughs> sort of... Uh, what, do, what do you do with that? Like... Uh... For example, uh, well, the adventure that that I remember the best because they ended up in that Arctic base is the 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 government was building simuloids, which are are these like artificial androids. If you've ever seen like a seventy sci fi movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. 
and the simuloids were getting out of control. Now, the, the, the group didn't care so much about that. They were trying to get out because they still had to get to the store to get groceries. So the adventure was them trying to escape the military base, but they'd keep running into, like, soldiers. And they keep running into these, like, weird simuloids. And the simuloids were trying to get out, too, but they were trying to get out by, like, capturing the players and taking their identity. Oh. And, well, and, how... and stealing well... their car. Okay. So, because that's the only way you can get up, because they're in the middle of nowhere. Nobody had a car. Right. That's why they didn't escape before. Um, and it, it's it's again it's 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 kind of like a regular adventure, except you can't rely on the big boss at the end. Okay. That there's there's always got to be some other goal, otherwise it usually ends up being really disappointing. Right. <laughs> okay. And uh, the monsters aren't helpless. Like a lot of them are relatively tough. It's just that. As a human, mm. if the player keeps their wits about them, they can usually figure out, oh, that's what takes this thing out. And then it's it's harmless once you acquire whatever its weakness is or you learn where to hit it or you, you learn about like what kind of things make it sad and then it goes away and cries and that kind of thing. Right. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it was salt water all along. Yeah, kind of. It's, right. it's, again, it's very like 80s B-movie. Right. But they drop the pretense. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is it's kind of like sci-fi original movie, the uh, role-playing <laughs> game. Oh my god, yeah, that is the best way of explaining it. Oh, okay. Holy smokes, okay. you're you're dead on. Like that really is the the idea and the feel to that to the game. Wow. So you could actually <laughs> run like Attack of the Humans, Sharknado. Yeah. Ba yeah. Basically, that's what the game amounts to. Like, holy smokes, that is exactly what the game. Because, yeah, like, you oh, see, okay. the sharks are dangerous, they kill people, but once the hero gets the chainsaw, then he's just, like, jumping through the air and cutting them in half, and that's how the game right. is designed. Yeah. Weird. Okay. No, that, that makes sense. No, 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 that's, <laughs> that, that, that's good. Wow, or Lavalantula, or, yeah. um... Oh, there's, anyway, like, a million... There's oct lots of them. Sharktopus, you know? Shark uh, <laughs> cyber Sharktopus, or whatever, yeah. <laughs> Versus Lavalantula versus Mega Python <laughs> fish. I don't know something like sure. that. <laughs> oh no, yeah, it's the. I, I know they, they just they, they they must have like a a barrel and they just kind of reach in and they just randomly pull up pieces of paper with animal names or pieces of like sci-fi stuff and then they just randomly put it together. I think. I don't at this point. Beware the piranha keat. I think there was a shark avalanche one. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, there was. There was like a avalanche shark attack or something. Yeah, shark to lanch or something. It's just, it's so bizarre what they've come up with. Mm -hmm. And I could, you know, I can totally see doing that as a as a role playing game. That would be mildly fun. Except the only thing is, in those games, you are supposed to be stopping the weird monster thing. Yeah. And you, you probably will. It's just there's going to be a lot of, like, wacky hijinks in between. Right, yeah. You can just have a whole lot of fun and, uh, you know, come up with lots of one-liners. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, actually, that, sound, that sounds, like, really entertaining. Yeah. The... But I, I, I was going to say, though, Don, you might want to take a cue or two from the, uh, the Paranoia game. And the players almost have, like, multiple characters, like... Mm -hmm. meaning that they, they, you know, they say they get like four characters and you know the idea being that they're not all going to survive it oh no it's yeah. it's it, the odds favor them you don't have to do that mm. that's oh i see that, that's why i say comparing them to like the sci-fi original movies is is dead on because you know who the heroes are right away you know that they're not going to get eaten you know even if their kid gets eaten they'll find a way to save them at the end that feel is basically the feel of the game that is is so perfect for describing oh. it Oh, I see. Okay, because in a weird way, I thought maybe you'd want to make if you were going to make like a like a sharktopus, <laughs> or uh, or is it five headed shark attack or sharknado type game? Uh -huh. You'd almost want to make it where the characters are. You know, the players have like a handful of characters that you know they can get killed off, and then the new guy steps in. Yeah, and a lot of those sci fi original movies, at least one or two guys, usually the old guy or something weird guy dies. Usually, usually they lose at least one person. Don't well, they? They usually lose a ton, but it's. When you find out who like the male and female leader, you know they're gonna win. Like there's there's oh, no yeah, question. They're, they're perfectly safe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah it's like oh, don't worry, Brooke Hogan will survive this somehow. 
and it'll be a yep. better world for it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay, so... I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I was going to say, because there's a bunch of, um, I guess you'd say, supplements and add-ons for otherwise serious games that really, I think, capture kind of the comedy thing, too. Okay. Such as? Ah, uh, because we were, we were talking about, like... Uh, like the 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 GURPS IOU is one, right? A- Atomic Horror, I think, kind of bridges that gap too, because that's like your fifties B movie game. Hmm. And they kind of kind of did my favorite. And this is one of my favorite comedy things ever. Was for uh, the old DC Heroes role playing game. They did uh, an ambush bug module. Okay. Which is called Don't Ask. So it's basically DC Heroes tune, is what you're telling me. It really is, and and it's one of the uh, it's one of the the bestest comedy because th- they make fun of comic books, they make fun of role playing games. Um, mm-hmm. There's actually a scene where uh, Ambush Bug comes to the real world, right? Because they give you like a mask on the back you can cut out and wear. Oh, okay. And that's when Ambush Bug shows up, and you're supposed to like grab a handful of snacks and smash them in your face, but you can't eat because it's a mask. And he's like, "Oh no, I'm still two dimensional. I have to get back to the comic book," and. Okay. And then the players follow him into the comic book, and what they say for that is you give everybody balloons, uh-huh. and nobody can talk. You have to write on the balloon what you're actually wanting to say and then hold it over your head. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's, it's just like it's a whole adventure of stuff like that. That was the one, Um, if you're familiar with uh, DC Heroes, they have uh, Killing Combat and Bashing Combat. Yes. So most of the time, if I don't specifically say I'm trying to kill the bad guy, I can hit him full blast, and it's assumed that, like, in superhero fashion, I'm pulling my punch, and the worst I'll do is knock him out. Right, yeah, yeah. In the game, what you're supposed to do is uh, stop World War III at Mm -hmm. one point. And if you don't, World War III happens, the bombs go off, the world is destroyed, but as the game says, but only for a little while because it's bashing combat. And that's an actual part of the adventure. Okay. And that's when you have to sell grit to get enough points to buy a time machine to go back and fix it. It's a... That's a bizarre adventure. <laughs> I haven't even gotten to Lex Luthor's part in it. But yeah, it's it's a, it really is. And it's it's a fantastic spoof. And it, I never got to run it. It's one, I've, I, it's one of the things I used to scare the group with. Right. I think you would have been great to run it. You should have run it if you had the chance. With with the right group. Because, yeah, there there was that. And then going to the comedy idea of coming out inadvertently. uh, Mm -hmm. The other other thing I used to terrify the group with, and Rob might remember, was GURPS Ice Age. (laughs) Okay. That I used to threaten, okay, if you guys don't straighten up next week, we're playing GURPS. Because GURPS Ice Age is, is like realistic caveman kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And everybody's like, so what would it be? Just us sitting around going, ha, ha, ha. And I'm like, yes, yes, it would. And I will run that thing for six months if I have to. And that became like what I used to like scare the group with if they yep. they were getting up. You and... kids don't quiet down back there. <laughs> I'm going to run GURPS Ice Age. And then they all said, well, we just like won't care. And I said, yeah, but what I'll do is your characters in this campaign, these will be their ancestors. So if anything happens to them, these other characters are never born. And everybody else would get pissed off, and I'd laugh. Ha, ha, ha. But it's comedy. Right. <laughs> it's comedy. Then I'm bummed. Mm-hmm. And, well, that goes back to what we said earlier. Any game could be run as a comedy game. It's just, you know, whatever take you want to do on it. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, yeah DC I, it's, it's comedy, funny. chill comedy. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember, uh, Rob, that one of the funniest memories I've ever had in, in a role-playing experience was uh, a game of Roadhogs. It was that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles After the Bomb supplement where you're basically playing like Mad Max. Right, yeah, yeah. With, with, with mutant animals. But and it, all this was was literally a bar fight that got out of control. <laughs> but I remember the group of us were almost in tears because we kept screwing up the roles. So the bar fight ended up being this weird, highly destructive... Um, like, do you ever see the movie uh, It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World? Mm-hmm. There's a fight scene in that movie at a, at a gas station oh. where the gas station gets demolished. 
It was literally that. And I remember like we were all laughing ourselves stupid because we were actually screwing up everything and causing all this destruction, <laughs> you know. So like, you know, jumping across the table, missing and smashing out the wall, like that kind of thing. Like it was and despite the fact that the rest of the game was dead serious, uh-huh. you know. I think we were trying to like deliver a uh like, you know, um uh, a, a serum that was a cure for a deadly disease, but they were having this hilarious you know, slapstick fight in the middle of it, you know, at a roadside bar. Mm-hmm. But that's what I mean. But you're right. It can literally go off the rails and then just become funny in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, ex- that's, hmm? oh. Oh, oh no, you first. And that's the thing about having the right group, right? Yeah. Especially ones yeah. who are suffering from sleep deprivation. Um, <laughs> you can, or, or, or in fairness, too much sugar. Uh, uh, because, mm. I remember back in our back in our days, you know, those two liter pop bottles, they would generally disappear over a period of three hours. And that was per person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we would be on serious sugar highs by the end of those games, usually. Mm -hmm. Caffeine, sugar, woo, through the roof. (laughs) And so, yeah, by the end of those games, we were either tired or wired. Sometimes Mm -hmm. both at the same time. (laughs) Um, So those games would often become a lot of fun that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's. 40k we had a uh, a five day warhammer 40k game it took like three days to set this thing up huge wow. huge game and we were up the whole time and that was uh yeah the because they used to sell jolt in two liter bottles and that's what we were going through at the time mm-hmm. and the thing everybody remembers just like the the second last day the mm-hmm. three of us are playing we're right in the middle of this big game and, and stanchi just looks up and he goes Guys, I don't feel so good. And he stopped. And I mean, he just stopped. He's sitting in the chair, staring blankly forward. Me and Doker are like, is he dead? And we're like poking him and he's not moving. We're like, how are we going to explain this to his family? (laughs) And he stayed immobile for like a half hour. We're just like, what do we do now? (laughs) He was basically catatonic is what you're saying. Yeah, he had like a little, and he woke up and was like, oh, what's going on? Like, okay, good, he's not dead. We don't have to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and so, yeah, those altered states can sometimes produce comedy games even where they're least expected. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, I think that even though I can't recall most of them right now, it's been a <laughs> while. Um, and I do think that I know that I've had some great, you know, funny games over the years, too. I wish I could remember one offhand, but I can't. So, whatever. <laughs> Um, Mm -hmm. and to me, that's always been a big part of gaming is just, you know, the laughs that go along with it. Yeah. And I do try to set up funny situations when I can, when I was running and usually that helps spice up the game a little bit because you don't just want grim all the time. You need balance, right? You need things to go a little lighthearted, a little serious. You, You know, you just have to have that balance when you're gaming. And I think comedy games, I think if anything, that is a game, their one problem is, is that you're trying to force the lighthearted all the time. Mm. And I do think games work best when there's a balance. Well, mm-hmm. makes sense. I mean, it's not like you're playing Pocathulu or something like that. <laughs> Which, by the way, folks, is an actual game. There is a Pocathulu game, but I don't know if it's a role-playing game. Is that a role-playing game, Don? Yeah. Yeah, it is. What do you do in a Pocathulu role-playing game? Uh, you go around capturing little evil boogly monsters and make them fight and try to stab off like insanity while doing so. Oh, okay. Well, that's perfectly reasonable. Yeah, it's it's not a big game. If you get the books, the books aren't really big because again, it's mm-hmm. it's sort of a a limited theme and really a limited campaign, much like anything so... Cthulhu related. <laughs> So can you? Yeah, I don't think it was really meant to be long term. It was just kind of a, uh, get it, Cthulhu and Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I, and I think some some comedy games are the result of that. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, there is one comedy game that's famous, or mm-hmm. at least I've seen seen in gaming stores forever, but I've never actually played mm-hmm. that we have not discussed. Oh. Actually, two, but the the first one is uh, Beach Bunny Bimbos with Blasters. Oh okay. Which I assume is basically just like Macho Women with Guns. Uh, there's a catch because that's the one um that's the tritac one it's meant to be a parody of uh of macho women with guns okay and it's it's the one i might have mentioned it before it uses the same system as the tritac games do 
mm-hmm. but it's stripped down because it's supposed to be more comedic. You're you're fighting Martians right. in it, right? But okay. holy crap, the system works really, really well. And if you were going to run like say a Stalking the Night Fantastic or like a Fringeworthy campaign, I'd mm-hmm. recommend picking that up and maybe using those rules instead because they're a lot easier to manage and they work just as well. It's really aw. It it kind of goes to your point. It's a comedy mm-hmm. game that right. It creates that weird balance by being solid enough that you don't have to run it as a comedy game if you don't want to. Right. Okay. Okay, I can see that. And the other game that's, um, again, I've seen seeing stores for forever but never played is Tales from the Floating Vagabond. <laughs> okay. Which I assume is based, isn't it based off like Callahan's Cross Time Saloon or something like that? Is, isn't that the point? Because there were those stories by Spider Robinson about some like, Cross Time Saloon, where all these characters would hang out. It was basically what Munden's Bar. Bar from Grimjack. Yeah, Munden's Bar from yeah. Grimjack. Yeah, it's it's not official because the official Callahan's role playing game is a GURP supplement. Oh, okay. But uh, the Floating Vagabond, it's the same idea, mm. and it's 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 one. Um, if I remember correctly, like you can actually, it's another comedy game you can die in. I think. Right. Uh, what I remember mostly is the adventures. Mm-hmm. That it was like paranoia that they wrote just some fantastic adventures. Right. They wrote some really like off kilter ones, but a lot of them are are pretty funny. Uh, they come up with odd situations. The cosmic paternity suit one is pretty funny. Where there's <laughs> okay. like there's this like ancient because remember like all the stories of Zeus coming to Earth and dallying with like the human women and that. Mm-hmm. But it's basically this god that's been doing that all across the multiverse, and now he's being served with all kinds of different paternity suits and stuff. Oh, okay. And then there's another one that it covers the, uh, it's like the, uh, the, the 1988 mm-hmm. presidential election. Right. Where the players go back in time and end up having a chance to screw that up really, really bad. And it's pretty funny. It's, it's, it's basically a, 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 polit- a political cartoon in game form. Okay, that's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, now, but by the name, I would assume that is it played like Munchausen, or is it played as an actual role playing game? No, it's an actual role playing game, and it's 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 got a lot of odd gamerisms in it. Uh, the idea is that yeah, it's 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 like Munden's Bar. That's the the best example. Okay, so it's this. So you can you can have the knight. The samurai, the Jedi, and the Time Lord all hanging out together, and then they all just wander out and go off to uh, 16th century France to uh, you know fight androids with Louis the Fourteenth or something. Yeah, or, or like yeah, because a lot of the adventures would be somebody comes into the bar and something happens, and that, and then that leads to them going off and and doing like and hijinks and sewers, as Chad often says. Right. <laughs> okay. I can see that. Um, Okay, so well, that I think that covers most of the noteworthy uh, comedy role playing games. Um, as I think I noted before the show, there are a bunch of others I've noticed. Mm-hmm. Most of them are modern ones, and they're often based on um, web comics. Yeah. For some reason, when people do web comics, they seem to also do a role playing game for fun to go along with it, which are usually fairly simple, cute little you know games based around that web comic. Yeah. Um, which there's nothing wrong with that's very cool that's fine but they're not they're not meant to be general games you're just supposed to be kind of be playing in the setting or whatever of the web comic um so they're usually semi-serious type things and a Uh, a lot of parodies of the world of darkness well yeah but world of darkness sets itself up for a lot of parodies yeah they even do parodies every uh like year they do a uh like april fool supplement Mm mm-hmm the Dudes of Legend one I highly recommend to anyone who plays like any of the uh, second edition World of Darkness. Okay, what's it about? It gives you game hacks. Oh, okay. To make things more like an like an action movie. Mm-hmm. And it's the kind okay. of it's the kind of thing you've seen in like other games. Right. But they take some of them to like like there's one you can um I forget what it's called but basically falling doesn't do any damage. Okay. So characters can, like, jump off skyscrapers. But you still have to make your perform check when you land to strike a cool pose. Mm -hmm. And then they talk about what happens depending on how well you make your cool pose roll. Like, sometimes the bad guy will just give up. Right, right, yeah. Superhero landing. 
Yeah, basically, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. If you screw up your superhero landing, you're screwed. Yep. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. That's funny. Um, <laughs> okay. So I think that's uh, that covers it pretty well. I think that mm -hmm. we've talked about pretty much all the major uh, comedy games that are out there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I think other than that, we're just going to go into like sort of weird little particulars of every all the every little game. And there's a whole bunch we never even talked yeah. about, like uh, um, Scared Stiff mm -hmm. and Critter Commandos, and but there's, there's a there's a lot. But I mean, they're all kind of running off the same wheelhouse. Yeah. Mm, pretty much. Of of, of 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 thinking, right? So, I guess if anything, I guess you could just sum it up as like how crazy you want it to go. Yeah. Yeah. Because I guess Toon would reflect that kind of the far end of that spectrum where it just goes berserk. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Almost non sequitur. And then you can kind of take it back the other way and go, well, something like, you know, paranoia might be a, as a good as a good sort of placement for the other end of that. Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. Because it, it still falls within a, like it's goofy, but it still has a parameter it has to sort of live within. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And you can run out of clones. Yeah. Yeah. And you Very should. Be careful. And you should if you're playing it right. That's right. <laughs> Unless you're a commie, in which case, well. <laughs> well, they did Traitor. that. Yeah, they did that too. There's a, a game that takes place. Because the, the communists are the uh, the uh, ever-present villains in, in Paranoia. And there is right. act, there's an adventure set in, uh, in the, uh, the, the communist version of Alpha Complex. Uh-huh. So, and they even give you the, uh, the old-timey Bolshevik, like, Russian mustaches that you can put on your character to show that they're the evil commie versions of their characters. And you're supposed to be playing the evil commie versions of your characters. Yeah, basically, yeah. And it functions, I suppose, exactly like the regular game does. You're just all speaking with funny Russian accents. Yeah, you've played. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds right. That sounds right. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. So, on that note, I think I'm going to bring this discussion to a close. Um, mm -hmm. I think we've done a pretty good survey of the major comedy role-playing games at this point and uh, talked a little bit about what goes into running a comedy role-playing game. Mm -hmm. Actually, we didn't, did we? Do you want to discuss, before I go on, do you want to discuss <laughs> um, what, how to run a comedy role-playing game, or do we want to go into that? Yeah, yeah. First off, step one: take drugs and or alcohol or lots of sugar. <laughs> that, yeah, okay. I think we got I got that covered. That's a yeah, that's a that's a plan. <laughs> it's running the game again. It's it's it comes down to that idea. If you're going to partake mm -hmm. of a comedy game, you have to sort of be able to to step back and let things mm -hmm. happen. Right. Like the game master has to be willing to let things get out of hand to throw things in that are going to purposefully monkey wrench their own campaign mm -hmm. and the players have to be willing to to let themselves look foolish and to even play it up for the sake of the the, the game right i think more than any other kind of role-playing game because we've talked about the idea that when you play a game when you're a participant in a game you are each other's audience mm-hmm like the players are the audience for the game master. You're the audience for all the other participants. That's why it's really rude to be on your cell phone in the middle of a fucking game. Put the phone away. But more so in comedy because you're sort of playing that up and you're playing to the group more than you're trying to solve the adventure or, or deal with the actual story. Right. So in the end, it's really just about doing your best to try to entertain the rest of the group. Yeah, like how many... I, I've met people that are really self-conscious about doing the funny voices. Mm-hmm. And, and it's because it's, it's, it's that idea. It inter, it's something else that occupies brain space away from trying to strategize the adventure. Mm -hmm. um, it draws attention to you doing the voice. People aren't mm -hmm. very good at it, but the key is... Especially for a comedy, but most of the guys I play with do funny voices for everything anyway, including real life. Um, <laughs> it's that idea that you don't want to be self-conscious because it's not supposed to be good. Mm. Like if you're playing the uh, that one 
paranoia adventure and you can't do a good stereotypical Russian accent. Right. That it ends up sounding more Jamaican or whatever. No, that just adds to the comedy. You have to be willing to to play that kind of thing up. That it's the ridiculousness and, and the epic fail of the situation that makes for the situation. Well, yeah, and that's going to be half the fun. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because after all, a, a true commie would actually hide his accent <laughs> behind a cheap Jamaican. <laughs> yes, man. Yes, they would. Yeah, and, right. Yeah. And then that's the idea, too. You have to be willing. And this is where the Baron Munchausen game, I think I would consider a role-playing game because it, 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 it takes this idea that you have to do in comedy of purposely dragging things to that ridiculous point. Mm. Like, you're doing it in most role-playing games anyway, but you're doing it with more structure. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that's why... You you can like play like a, an epic D and D campaign and say, forsooth we must head to the pass and defeat the Legion of Evil before they reach the castle, and feel perfectly content because that's kind of like a convention of the setting. It's mm. it's part of the structure. But if you're like playing like cyberpunk, and all of a sudden, forsooth we must reach the constable and tell them that the gang villains have reached the... It, it, it's weird, and people are going to stare at you, and then they're going to laugh, but... Right, but that's kind of the point. Yeah, you can play that for the laugh, and learning to do that is the trick to playing like a comedy game and getting something out of it, because, because you're each other's audience. If you're not very good at that, you're basically going to be boring each other. Okay, I think that's an excellent summary. So on that note... Um, thank you everyone for listening. I hope you found our survey of comedy role-playing games fun and interesting and maybe even a little entertaining. <laughs> thank you for joining us, Chad. We really appreciate you coming out again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's great, guys. I, mean, I always love coming here. So it's, uh, by all means, I, I encourage you to do it in the future more. <laughs> okay, well, um, we'll we'll consider it. It will depend on how much you pay us. And, um, would, would some wooden pennies count as payment? <laughs> I only accept doubloons, sir. Only gold doubloons. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think my next campaign for scaring the players, I'm going to have to get a copy of that My Little Pony game. Good night, folks. Have a great one. Thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like to hear more or join the conversation, come visit us at obeythedna.com. You can also find us on iTunes or whatever fine podcast site forgot to lock their back door. So until next time, remember that to master the nerdly arts takes time, practice, and enough Coca-Cola to drop a rhino. See ya! over and join the conversation at obeythedna.com where you will find show notes and more.